stand up for yourself And I'll back you up Cause problems don't solve themselves I'll tell you what Instead of would or could I think you should Draw a line in the sand and stand your ground It's for your own good Hello, my name is Roy Poyan, and I'm the director of Families Impacted by Opioids, and I want to thank you for joining us for another episode of The Voice of Families in Addiction. Today we're going to go through um, a little bit of a kind of a thought process, and we're hopefully going to have an one way but open discussion about, and it doesn't have to be one way, you can email me or call me if you'd like to come up with comments on any of this. Um, but what we want to do is we want to look at what What's going on when we're dealing with drug addiction in terms of inside the family and the family relationships and the family dynamic? And um, of course, your Family Social Fine and Learning Center can provide you with education materials. It's a little bit deeper dive on, on the relationship side. So what, when, we're, uh, when we're looking at this, we're typically responding to it when something like bad has happened. All of a sudden, there's this change in the person's behavior. And as the, the first, you know, as parents or siblings, uh, we want to confront this poor behavior. But when we're angry with them, uh, that, that, that's usually what comes out. Not, not so much our intent, but our anger. And, and so the, the, the purpose of what we want to discuss today is, you know, how do we lower our anxiety in order to be able to better deal with, um, you know, in a learning sense, this person's behavior and confront it so that it can offer an opportunity for change. Changing destructive behavior it begins with effective and appropriate confrontation, okay? <laughs> Once again, we're, we're back to this topic of change. That's not by error. That's just the way this is. This whole journey is about change. But the fact is, if we confront the person with this like thrust of, this makes me so angry when you do this, or I'm so disappointed in you. Okay, let's slow down there because um, it's understandable that you feel that way. However, we're talking about this before it happens. So we can be a little bit more subjective in this conversation than maybe I would find you if you were to call me and say, hey, Roy, this is what I'm dealing with. And then you spend the next 30 minutes spouting out all of your anger, of which <laughs> probably some of your childhood experiences are blended into that anger and anxiety too. But you know, let's not go there. When parents first discover that their child has done something wrong, their initial response is usually, and I'm saying parents, but I also mean uh, friends and, and family members and siblings, is to jump right in and try and control or force a behavior change. Unfortunately, the parents often end up screaming and arguing with, the, with this person. This only drives the family further apart on critical issues. It's like, no, we really need to solve this. You keep getting angry and that keeps messing this whole thing up. Well, of course I'm angry. Well, of course you have a right to be angry. We, we, we get that. But remember, we're dealing with this before it actually happened. So we can be a little bit more subjective to the scenario that we're setting up. To allow to continue this type of family conflict can be extremely harmful in the relationship that you want to be able to have in order that you can effectively help the person, be there for the person, and, and see that you know, the right elements are included uh, that you have control over in making a part of the environment. So what ends up happening then is uh, problems occur. And the parents usually jump right in and try and force that change. And they, they, they find themselves kind of like having an expectation. I just showed you my anger. <laughs> now, this person is either going to do one of two things. They're either going to think you're, you're totally out of your mind or you've lost it or, you know, what a jerk you are. And they're not going to listen to you. Or they're going to get defensive and they're going to lash back or they're not going to listen to you at all. Did you take for a minute before you were angry to figure that out? Because that's exactly what you just produced. Uh, 
how many times when it has to do with drug addiction do we do this? Oh, we do it all the time. And how many times is that the outcome? Oh my gosh, I can't begin to tell you. Oh, I won't say all the time, but you know, a lot of the time. So what do you expect? You know, I mean, okay, hold on. When you started to do this, what did they expect? Well, they expected that you were going to yell. They expected that you were going to blame and shame them. And they expected that you wouldn't hear anything that they had to say. Well, those are two like really coercive, corruptive, you know, bad expectations on our side and theirs. This is not a good, you know, dialogue or situation. The question is, could we do better? Absolutely. Well, how? You've just started, okay? Just because, and I'm not saying just because you're listening to this, just because you are taking time to consider that you do do these things, and by the way, we all do these things, and so don't feel bad or shamed or guilty. Just, you know, take, take knowledge and use it, okay? Determine a solution from it and develop a decision and create a plan of action on what you're going to do about it. That, that, that's your coping skills. So, you know, because children are driven by emotion, you know, the, the, the prefrontal cortex, the hippocampus, the ganglia, uh, you know, nuclei, all these parts of the brain, of which most of the names I can't even pronounce, are, are part of our emotions. They're part of our logic and reasoning. They're what makes everything work but they're not developed in a child's brain. And in an adult brain, they're not developed really fully until they're about, I don't know, what do they say, 22, 23? Well, that's a heck of a thing. Well, that's a heck of a thing, considering they're starting to use drugs at 17, okay? So we're talking to them and screaming at them at 19 and 21 because they graduate high school. They have no plans of going anywhere because drugs are in their life, and they're really floundering. They're not, you know, achieving the transition from child to adulthood, uh, that's being uh, staggered. So with that in mind, what we're doing is we're using an ineffective tool in dealing with emotions. You don't use anger, blame, and shame if you're trying to help the person with their emotions. I mean, come on. I, I think we all can, can, can realize that. So you need to take a few minutes and kind of like understand confrontation. Well, no, Roy, we're not, we're not having a conversation. We're having a conversation. I'm telling them exactly what I want them to do. Yeah, okay. You're talking about confrontation because of the way that you're approaching it. You're trying to manipulate how they feel. And boy, I'll tell you what, if you're using what we just mentioned, you're, you're not being very successful. I can guarantee you that. So part of the answer is because we as parents frequently make the mistake of trying to convince our children that our reasoning is correct. Oh, come on. You can't say that. Yeah, no, actually, it's, it's true. We're, we're, we're spending our time trying to convince them that the way we think is better than the way you think, and you shouldn't think that way because I don't think that way because I am more reasonable than you. Huh. Let's face it. Let's face one thing. They are an individual. Let's take a, a paper. I'm just going to do a sidebar here. Um, and it's in um, the Journal of Business and Psychology. And it was, um, it's published by Barbara Weiss. And uh, she's a psychologist uh, at the university in, um, in the Netherlands and with, a, with a colleague, um, Ed Selbos. And, and this is uh, on July uh, 5th, 2015 uh, study. And basically the abstract, which is, as we discussed before in a study, there's an abstract that explains to you kind of the setup of, of a study. Uh, purpose. Uh, organizational change can be a major stress factor for families. They investigated stress responses 
and the fact that these stress responses can be explained by the extent to which they match the self-construal. And what a construal is, is in a person's collective terms of who they are. If you're going to stress somebody's identity, their construal of who they are, then you're probably not going to get the structural change you're looking for. This is true for employers, and that's what this article was driven off of. But we're kind of annotating it. I'm giving myself uh, a liberty here, which nobody's afforded me but me. But it, it makes sense that if, if you're going to attack a person for the person that they are, then, and you expect that this is going to change how they see themselves, then you're way off base. And you would benefit by, once again, seeking, seeking the advantages of meeting with a family therapist to help you better understand structural and strategic behavioral therapy by Murray Bowen. So you would, you would want to, according to NIH and SAMHSA, you would want to ask for your HMO for a therapist that practices Bowen family therapy, either structural or strategical or, or multi-level family therapy would also be advantageous as well as multi-systematic therapy. I'm just trying to tell you that Goodyear tires are good, but I believe that Michelin tires are better and they've been proven to be so. They're a little bit more expensive, but they're better. So with that same in mind, ask for the kind of therapies that are in family therapy that have been empirically proven. And, and that, sorry about the sidebar on this, but it is important to understand. So what, what do you want to do, okay, if you don't want this to be confrontational? If you want to change your expectations and their expectations, which we just identified, are really not going to get you there. And we've already identified from this clinical paper of when change causes stress, that when you go after somebody's personal construal, their, their self-esteem, their self-identity, you're, 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 you're not going to get the kind of change you want. The harder you go at them, the more, the more of a structural, you know, uh, adversity you're going to create inside of them and therefore they're not going to do what you want them to do. So how can we do it differently? Well, you know, sometimes explain your reasonings to the person once or twice. Then calmly restate the rule that applies to this and then identify the consequence if the rule is not obeyed. Uh, let me repeat that. Explain your reasons once or twice. Then calmly state or restate the rule and the consequences if the rule is not followed. At this point in the conversation, you should not re-explain the rule. Okay? Don't keep re-explaining the rule. They get the rule. And children, you know, the, the older the children, the more they'll get it, okay? The younger the child, the less developed the mind, the less likely they are to fully understand and embrace what it is that you're doing. So does, does the timing impact the, uh, the presentation of your, your statement? And the end results, absolutely, it does. Um, parents should not confront the child's problematic behavior as soon as, excuse me, you should confront the child's problematic behavior as soon as possible after the incident. So don't let a whole bunch of time go by thinking, well, we'll discuss it tomorrow. You know, don't do that. They, they should, however, not, never confront this, this person while you're in anger. See, that's a mistake we all make. You know, we're hot, we're ready to get this off our chest, and we just blast. You, you, you're ending up with the same result every time. Why are we surprised? When, when a parent finds they are angry because of their child's behavior, they must first address their own anger. So mindfulness is a, is a great way to take yourself down a couple of notches. Deep breathing, 
Um, remove yourself from the environment for just a minute. Um, settle yourself. Get your feelings in line before you start to address the issue. This is a must do, okay? I, I, I've been in a room with a family where you know, the, the parent just lit off like a bottle rocket. And, and this person did this during several sessions. And every time the child responded exactly the same way. And then the person would look at me like, you see, there he goes again. <laughs> I don't mean to laugh, but it's like, well, yeah, you know, you lit off a firecracker and they jumped. So what do you expect? You attack their person. They felt threatened. They were attracted. Their response was to get defensive. So they battered back with, with something that they knew would bother you. And what did you achieve? Now I'm saying it like, you know, why don't you know any better? And I don't mean to. This is a very bad situation and very bad habits are being used that could be corrected, by the way. It doesn't take many sessions with a family therapist. Once, you, once you've identified the problem and where it sources from, it may be from your childhood, maybe your, your mother treated you that way. But once you give that room to breathe and get, get some air behind it and, and ha let it have its own identity, you, you can then not use it in what you're doing because you can identify that you're using it. You can say, no, I'm not going to use that. I'm not going to use the way my mother treated me in the summer of 72 when we were at Lake you know, Wabagamba, you know, up in the Appalachian Mountains. And, and she did it in front of all my friends. And now I'm dealing with my child at the swimming pool. And, you know, and I'm lighting off just the same way that she did. Because you've met with a family therapist, you can start to identify that pattern as it's happening. This is really nice. It's, it's, it's called a coping skill that you're developing with them. So timing has a lot to do with it. You know, develop a plan or an outline. You've already set the rule, right? You've already set, Jerry, you're not allowed to come around the house while you're stoned or while you're using. And uh, if you're sober or you're abstinent for, you know, a period of time, and you can state what that time is, a month, a week, whatever you feel comfortable with. But, you know, that's, that's the boundary that you're setting for yourself. And you need to write an outline of how are you going to respond when that boundary is broken? more than likely will be. If not broken, it'll certainly be tested. And um, by having a plan, you're going to feel a lot more comfortable with the boundary that you've set. So pick a private and neutral place to have this dialogue. You want to sit there and say, well, you know, um, I'm not going to do it here in the garage or the front lawn or I don't want, I want my family room to be a room of peace and shared sharedness. So when we have these discussions you know, we're going to go off to the patio and sit down in a calm way and discuss this. And I'm not going to negotiate. I'm going to use the, uh, what we've already identified as, you know, the steps and, and I'm going to outline it and, and I'm going to give it to them the way, the way that I've done without the anger. So you want to minimize any interruptions, um, you know, if, if you've got a little daughter or, you, you know, just say to the husband, you know, or, or another sibling, um, watch Jane for a little bit. Uh, Bob and I are going to be out on the patio. We don't want to be interrupted. And then um, prepare yourself for the worst, okay? You know, what, what, you know, prepare yourself for the fact that they may not accept what you're saying at all, okay? So that you don't then, you know, digress towards the end of what was a really good, well-prepared uh, presentation of yourself so that you've included timing, you've developed your plan and your outline, you've chosen a neutral place to have a dialogue, you've minimized interruptions, and you've prepared yourself for the worst. So that seems kind of like um, that last part, defeatist. It's not. It's not defeatist. It's pragmatic. And um, when the worst doesn't happen, you'll feel good because you're ready for it, but you didn't even need it. So what are the steps that can create a highly effective parenting outline? Well, write down the word I love in your outline. And then know that begin by telling your child how much you love them. That's not a weakness. That's not a vulnerability. Well, it's kind of a vulnerability. They may say back to you, I don't love you right now. But um, that's probably part of the worst. But... The fact is, uh, you'll, you'll see it coming. 
and then write down, I see. So you've got, I love. Begin by telling your child how much you, he's loved or she's loved. And then I see, describe specific unwanted behavior. This is what I see. And then I feel, tell your child exactly how you feel. Remember, dear man, this is the same concept of dear man. Describe, express, action, and then um, relate. I feel, listen, after describing how you feel, just listen. Don't, kind of, don't try and control how they respond. Don't counterpoint, counter everything that they say. Just listen. Don't feel you have to respond to anything that they say. I mean, you can choose what you want to respond to, but you know, our suggestion is, is don't. Give them a place where they can freely express themselves without a retort, without a comeback. Just let them lay it out there. It does you no harm. It's sitting on the patio, uh, you know, slate. It's on the ground there. It's like, fine, okay. I want to describe, meaning I want is the next one. So there was listen, and then I want. Describe the behavior and state and reinstate the house rule, okay? And then I will. And tell your child what you will do to support this success. Wow. Well, now you're, now you're setting up your expectations in a very positive way. And you're setting up their expectations in a very positive way. So after the conversation has begun, parents should be prepared for anything that might follow. A defensive attitude is probably what you're going to get. Okay? You're probably going to see anger. Why are you always picking on me? You know, denial. It wasn't that late. It, I didn't do that. Billy did it, and I didn't do it. I, that's the reason I came in the way I did. Um, bluffing. Go ahead. Take all my things away. See if I care. Yep. Just remain calm. Return to your original reasoning for the confrontation. And again, express your concern. Make the expectations of your child's future behavior clear. Clarify the rules if necessary. But you don't want to have to keep going through those. Like, you're accountable to be the only one that remembers the rules. Maybe you ask them to tell you what they understand the rules are. Um, and then end the meeting on a positive note. I know you are more than capable of doing this. I have faith in you. I know you can do this. Keep the onus on them, not you. Otherwise, you're going to create a codependency relationship, and they will take full advantage of that, just naturally. So insist your child look at them, apologize for the confrontation, um, don't judge your child. Don't preach or lecture to your child. That, that's not going to benefit anyone. Don't use scar sarcasm. I see that a lot. You know, where we feel that if we throw them off their game by, by criticizing who they are and trying to disassemble any self-esteem that they have left, uh, that we're in charge and we're in control of them. You, you want to talk about weak parenting skills and a weak person. That, that's what that type of person does. I don't need to be critical, but when you see it, it's like, oh my gosh, do you realize what you just did to this kid? And, and that wasn't what you were looking for as an outcome at all. What did you expect? Anyhow, so we digress. It, it, parenting is tough. I mean, it's really tough. Throwing drug addiction in the middle of parenting, that's insane. Why would you want that? Well, we didn't want it. You know, it was this damn, it was this damn process that brought it to our family. And now we have to deal with it. But there's no way we woke up in the morning and said, Boy, what I would love to hear this morning is that my kid is addicted to uh, opioids. That would be just great. So what will you say? I love, I see, I feel, listen, I want, and I will. Okay? So with that in mind, you're then going to start to take a look at, you know, what, what, what types of threats are you dealing with? Well, I'll run away, or I'm going to commit suicide, or, you know, I'm, I'm going to get them back for all that they did to me. You know, I'm going to disown my friends. Well, you know, you, you, you gotta, you, you gotta kind of deal with that. You can't just, but, but the fact is they probably have a lower self image. They're exaggerating the view of the problem. I mean, or otherwise they wouldn't say these things. So they're probably lacking in direction on how to respond. 
uh, a severe re reaction uh, might might be you know um, you might fear the severe reaction. Ask them to explain how they would go about doing that. You know, you're not going to make it happen by doing that, but you know they they may hear themselves and realize that's pretty silly. You know, I'm just hurting myself if I do that. You know, I want to hurt other people, not me. So you know, give give them a chance to you know more or less give breath to their response if their response is uh, one of drama and over exaggeration. Uh, I would suggest you get a family therapist on board. This isn't my area, but um, I think that a family therapist could help you to determine well in advance of it happening what are some good responses and healthy uh, for both you and the characteristics of the child that you're dealing with. So you want to start to like steps of success. You want to create steps of success. You, 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 you want to see yourself in an area of understanding that uh, family members are more effective in reaching their goals when they focus more on how and what and not why. Don't spend your time on the why. When you're going down and you hit rapids and it gets intense, I don't know if you've ever been whitewater rafting, uh, I did and our boat flipped and my little boy went right into the water and underneath rocks and I, he didn't come up. You know, and I jumped off the boat. Oh boy, this is such a cool story. And I grabbed him and I brought him to the top of the water. Boy, did I feel like dad. But anyhow, I, I digress. The fact is, when you're going down a river and you hit these turbulent you know, rocks, you don't ask why the rock is there. You know, Gee, I wonder why that rock is there. Wham, bam, slam. No, that, that's not how you handle it. You say, how can I navigate around this? What do I need to do? That's where you need to be spending your journey with substance use disorders and not spending it on the why. You know, why did this ever happen to us? Why did he take drugs? You know, that's not going to get you to where you need to be in terms of learning. If you want to do that on another sphere, that's, that's fine. But don't confuse the two. You're not becoming more knowledgeable by finding out the why. You're becoming more knowledgeable with things that you can use to determine a solution, develop a decision, and design a plan of action, your three coping skills. Everything you're doing in knowledge is to be applied to your 3D coping skills to determine a solution, develop a decision, design a plan of action about this situation you're dealing with. That's why you're getting knowledgeable. So with that in mind, we, we want to take into account that, you know, families are more effective and efficient when family members realize the individual families have different talents. They respond to tr stress differently and have different abilities and different skills that might be rooted in genetics, in past experiences that they had. Individuals should pay close attention to the traits, both positive and negative, and the weaknesses they have, meaning you have, as a member of the family. And by attending to these, in terms of challenges, we can increase the chances of doing well in our relationships. So what did I just say, which was a quote out of Randall Day's book, Introduction, to Family Process, 5th edition. It's a very good book. It's more written for students and text, but I, I picked it up, and I am not a student. <laughs> I haven't been a student for a long time. Although I kind of feel like in life, we're all students. Boy, I know you are if you're listening to this podcast and you're dealing with uh, addiction in your family. You are a student, and if you don't consider yourself that, you probably should, because that's the posture that you need to be in. Who are you a student of or about? yourself. Yourself as it relates to the changes that are needed in your life. Remember what we said about where does the source all come from? It's the individual family member. That's you and me. And when we start to get it right, a lot of things follow. When we start to strengthen ourselves, a lot of things follow. When we put in a family solution finder learning center in our county, a lot of things follow. When we have the Family Solution Finder Learning Series, that'll take us through the 32 key issues we're likely to face 
on a journey as a family with, with substance use disorders, a lot of this follows. How about if we include the community agencies and non-for-profits that give us services? Yep. How about if we include the first responders? Yep. How about if we include all the stakeholders, all eight stakeholders? Yep. And the faith groups? Yep. And the legal system? Yep. All right. That's a lot. No, not really. All I've suggested is that you install a Family Solution Finder Learning Center in your community. And we'll give it to you. And then one step at a time, you will start to develop your family. That's where we want you. That's where you're going to make a difference. That's when the family stops this genocide of families that we incorrectly call a drug war. It's not a drug war. It's an attack on our families, plain and simple. I want to thank you for viewing this episode of The Voice of Families and Addiction. My name again is Roy Poyan, and I would greatly welcome your phone call. If you'd like to talk about what we discussed here today, that would be fabulous. Uh, if you'd like other types of materials, I'll provide them for you at no cost. If you'd like to set up a learning center, give us a call. We'll walk you through all the steps. It's very simple to do. God bless you on your journey and in learning more and creating changes that are meaningful in the lives of yourself and the others that you love. Stand up for yourself and I'll back you up Cause problems don't solve themselves I'll tell you what Instead of would or could I think you should Draw a line in the sand and stand your ground It's for your own good